What up? I'm B, and welcome to my channel where we talk about all things true crime and current events. Today is another episode of Crafty Crimes where you and I sit down together, we talk about something related to the true crime world, and we do a little crocheting at the same time. Today's case is one that is very sad but also incredibly interesting and several of you have actually asked me to look into it and report on it and um, a few weeks ago I had talked about it in another video saying I didn't know how I wanted to approach it and um, I, I just didn't know the right way to do it because there are some additional circumstances that aren't always the case with each case or topic that we look into. So. I sat down, I thought about it, I finally figured it out, and today we are going to be covering the case of Alyssa Turney, and when we get to the end of it, I will tell you what those additional details and extenuating circumstances are. So let's go ahead and get started. Alyssa Turney was born on April 3rd, 1984, and her mom's name was Barbara. She was a single mom, and so she had Alyssa and Alyssa's older brother named John. Uh, a few years after this, when Alyssa was about three, Barbara met a man named Michael, and they ended up getting married in 1987, and they had this big, blended family. Uh, Barbara had two kids, like I said, and then Michael had three sons of his own. And the sons were all a little bit older, including John, Barbara's son, and Alyssa was the baby of the family. But about two years later, Michael and Barbara had a child of their own named Sarah. And at this point, everything pretty much seemed great. You know, they were this big family, they were blended together, everyone was getting along fine. Michael made it very clear that, you know, nobody is a stepchild, nobody is a step-sibling, we are a family. Everyone is family. And it, they, you know, they had this loving home. Michael was basically like a super dad. He told everybody that he was Barbara's knight in shining armor who had rescued her. And he was super involved um, with his son's baseball teams. He was like a baseball coach for them growing up. He was a Boy Scout leader. And in the 70s, before they met, Michael had worked uh, for the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office. They lived in Phoenix, Arizona, and so uh, he worked for the county, the sheriff's office, and then eventually he started to work in the electrical field. And unfortunately, in 1992, Michael was injured. He um, got hurt on the job, and then he ended up being laid off. And the really tough part about this is that at the same time that this happened, you know, just a few months before he got laid off, Barbara, Alyssa's mom, had been diagnosed with cancer. And so she she was really struggling with it. Mentally, she was there, she was a trooper, she was fighting, but it just seemed like things kept getting worse. And then on top of that, you get Mike who's laid off and it's just, it's a stressful time. And unfortunately, three weeks after Mike was laid off, Barbara passed away. You, you know, she was sick. She was definitely not a vision of health, but for the most part, according to Barbara's family and her daughter, Sarah, she was okay. You know, obviously she had cancer. Obviously she wasn't at her strongest, but she was there mentally. She was, she was pretty aware. She was, um, as strong as you could expect her to be and her passing seemed kind of sudden and on top of that coincidentally she passed away the very night before her life insurance policy was set to expire so maybe keep that in mind throughout the story after Barbara's death there was definitely a shift in the household uh, while she was still alive, while they were still this big, happy family, like I said, Mike was super dad. He was always on top of stuff. The house was clean. There was home-cooked meals. It was a loving environment, but uh, things got pretty rough, you know? It's always hard to lose a spouse, and Mike didn't really seem like he had any interest in 
and getting through it and getting back to the normalcy, it was just like, okay, well, this is how things are now. This is the new normal. And at this point, you know, because like I said, all of the sons were older, it is just Michael in the house as well as his stepdaughter Alyssa and his biological daughter Sarah. And something really interesting is that, you know, Mike had this, this big aversion to stepdaughter, step-siblings, we are a family, we are one, you know, we're, we're all equal, no one is, no one's different. But the way that he treated Sarah and Alyssa, those were two very different things. Sarah was, like I said, his biological daughter. She was the younger of the two and she was allowed to do basically whatever she wanted. If she wanted McDonald's for dinner, she was allowed to have it. If she wanted to skip school for the day, Mike would be like, yeah, I'll call you out. If she wanted to go to a party, go have fun. Literally anything she wanted to do, she was allowed to do. The only rule that she had was that she wasn't allowed to smoke cigarettes. Like her dad let her drink underage. He would buy beer for her and her friends. But smoking, no, because I get it. Barbara passed away from smoking and so that's where he draws the line. He's very much against cigarettes, but everything else, that's on the table. Sarah can do whatever she wants. And essentially, Michael was Sarah's best friend. Alyssa, on the other hand, was on the complete opposite end of the spectrum. Uh, in public, it appeared that Alyssa was just pretty much ignored. There are home videos where, um, this was even when they were a lot younger, when Barbara was still alive, where Sarah is being absolutely doted on. And Alyssa is crying for attention, not crying, but, but you know, it's like a cry for help, a cry for attention. Dad, look at me, look at me, get my outfit, look at me. And Michael has no interest in looking at Alyssa. It is all about Sarah. Publicly, Alyssa, she has no value according to these home videos. We don't care about filming her. But in private, Alyssa was being watched like a hawk. She was basically being monitored at all times. Mike had cameras all over their home, including in Alyssa's room. Uh, he would hide them in the vents. He would be recording constantly, even in like private intimate moments between her and her boyfriend as she got older. And he had recording devices on their home phone. So anytime a call was made or a call came in, it was recorded. Additionally, he would watch Alyssa work sometimes. She worked at Jack in the Box, which is a fast food restaurant. And so he would just show up in the parking lot with a camcorder and record her through the windows. It's super weird. Um, but, but so he would, he would just watch her, everything she did. He was making sure that she was, she was safe, basically was, was what he wanted to express to people is Alyssa has to be watched. She is, she's so gullible. She's not super smart. She's easily fooled. She's a wild child. She needs to be monitored. She needs to be watched. You know, Alyssa wants to drink and smoke weed. Sarah, yeah, Sarah can smoke weed. Sarah can drink, but Alyssa wants to go to a party and she needs to be looked out for. She had such a bad memory. She was so gullible. She didn't know how to take care of herself, all this stuff. And soon thing super interesting is that even to this day, Alyssa's sister, Sarah is like, Alyssa has a great memory. Like her memory of things that when we were kids, like stuff that happened, stuff that we went through, I don't remember it, but Alyssa remembers it. Like Alyssa has a great memory, so I don't know what you're talking about, but that's what Mike decided to harp on. And if constantly being doubted and talked down to by your stepdad, who is supposedly loves you just as much as a biological dad would, um, here's, here's a part that's pretty rough. Um, this is something that was very much hidden from Sarah the other siblings, and pretty much everyone, really. Um, from the time that Alyssa was a small child, she had told several different people that Michael was sexually abusing her. After Barbara passed away, Mike started dating Alyssa's fourth grade teacher, and she plainly told this teacher, I have sex with my dad. And I don't know 
precisely what the teacher did with this information. Apparently she had approached Mike about it and they got into a bit of an altercation about it, but um, I, I don't know that she ever reported it to the police or to Child Protective Services, which as a mandatory reporter she should have, but I can neither confirm nor deny if she did that. I just know that nothing drastic came from Alyssa telling her this. And additionally, uh, she told some of her friends that when she was younger, Mike would abuse her. And she also told her high school boyfriend that um, at one point her dad had picked her up from school. He picked her up early, drove her out to the desert and tried to fool around with her. And if, you, if you're not familiar with Phoenix, you might be like, that's weird. What do you mean he took her out to the desert? Phoenix is basically in the desert, so there's like the city obviously, but then uh, where they're at in Phoenix, if you go like north or east, about 20 minutes, you can be in the desert. So, you know, for him that wouldn't have been like an all day thing. It could have been a quick errand to pick her up, take her out to the desert and try to abuse her. Additionally, there is footage from the 90s where Sarah, Michael, and Alyssa are all outside and Alyssa's like messing with the camcorder. Michael's kind of telling her how to work it, stuff like that. And Alyssa is yelling, Sarah, Sarah, Sarah. And when Sarah finally gets the lens trained on Alyssa, she looks directly at the camera and says, dad's a pervert. Michael gets pretty flustered at this and takes the camera away from Sarah at this point and then um, he audibly recognizes and realizes that Sarah was recording that and his response is to say, and Sarah's a big moron. So we've got some suspicious behavior going on. We've got some things that aren't quite adding up to the most healthy parent-child relationship and Here's something else that we're going to add to our list of suspiciousness. In the year 2000, Michael secretly made Alyssa sign a contract stating that she had never been molested by him and he kept it for his own records. So overall, this is something that is definitely sketchy and Alyssa has tried to kind of reach out to different people about it and and tell them each a little bit of her story, but it isn't really taken seriously. It's like she's kind of, for some reason, she's not really um, like full force telling people or, or trying to get something done about it. And I definitely think that she's probably a little bit scared to do that and scared of what will happen to Sarah. She doesn't want to hurt her little sister by revealing something. I don't, I don't know what her motivation is, but Alyssa's telling people what's going on. She's not forcefully going at it. She's not telling any everyone who will listen, but she's saying enough. And so aside from the story, I just want to let you know if you are a teenager or a young person and you hear a friend say something that doesn't quite sit right with you or that concerns you or you just have some questions about and you don't really know how to approach it and, and you don't know what to do, or if you are in a situation that you don't know if it's if it's healthy or if it's damaging or is this relationship that I have with my boyfriend, my parents, whoever, is this normal or is this abuse? In the description box, there is a website for that'snotcool.com. If you click the specific link, it will take you to a PDF full of resources for um, abuse, incest, questions about bullying, stuff like that. and you can call it, you can get answers if you don't know how to approach your friend and you need some help talking to them or you don't know how to process what's happening to you and, and you just need someone to talk to or you need some resources. There are tons of numbers on there. Do not hesitate to call one of them and, and just get your questions answered or, or vent or do whatever, whatever you need to do. You are not alone. There are resources for you and if you or someone you know are experiencing or think you are experiencing any form of abuse, please use one of those resources and report it to the proper authorities. Now back to Alyssa's story. Her dad made her sign that contract in the year 2000 and then on May 17th, 2001, Alyssa went missing. 
That day was the last day of school before summer break and Michael decided to pick Alyssa up a little bit early and take her out to lunch. Because it was the last day of school, obviously there were going to be tons of parties going on that night and so while Alyssa was heading up to the office to get picked up by her dad, she'd stopped by her boyfriend's classroom and she'd spoken to several of her friends. Uh, she was just letting them know, hey, my dad's picking me up, we're gonna go to lunch and I'll see you tonight. But she didn't make it to those parties. And this is what happened according to Michael. He picked her up from school and took her to lunch. While they were at lunch, they'd gotten into this big fight about Alyssa's curfew. She didn't like having such an early curfew and she didn't like that she had to check in with her dad so often. She just wanted to go out and have fun. It was her last summer. She was a junior in high school. So her last summer before her senior year, she wanted to just go have fun and not have to worry about checking in with him constantly. But you know, if you grew up with a curfew, you know your parents will be like, no, <laughs> you're not an adult. You still live in my house. As long as you live in my house you'll obey my rules and her dad's rule was that she had this curfew and she had to check in with him as often as he wanted because he was so worried about her you know the wild child the one who was gullible the one who always needed help he didn't want anything bad to happen to her so she's got to check in so they get to some point in this conversation where it's, it's a stopping point or a pausing point and they end up going home and uh, when they get there, Alyssa storms into the house as one does when you're 17 and super mad at your parents. She stormed in, went straight to her room, had no interest in talking to Michael. Michael supposedly went out to run a few errands and then was planning on going to pick up Sarah, his youngest daughter. Now, he was out running these errands for quite a while because he didn't end up picking Sarah up until between 4 and 5 p.m. that day. Now, this isn't necessarily odd. Sarah was pretty used to her dad not really showing up on time, so she ended up going to a friend's house. Her friend was in, within walking distance, and uh, she hung out there until her dad came to pick her up. And when he came to pick her up, he was pretty agitated pretty upset. He said that he had been trying to call Alyssa. She wasn't answering. Here, take my phone. You call her. Keep calling her. Keep calling her. Keep calling her. She's not answering. Keep calling her. So Sarah's, you know, sitting in the car on their way home calling Sarah or calling Alyssa over and over and over again. She's not answering. And when they first get home, Sarah is the one who goes into the house first. She goes right to Alyssa's room and finds out that uh, Alyssa's backpack has been just completely dumped out on the floor. All of her stuff is still there, but the backpack was emptied. And then on top of Alyssa's dresser, there's her cell phone and there's a note. And the note was addressed to both Michael and Sarah. And it said, Dad and Sarah, when you dropped me off at school today, I decided I really am going to California. Sarah, you said you really wanted to be gone. Now you have it. Dad, I took $300 from you. That's why I saved my money. So the first part of that note. It wasn't really too odd. They did have an aunt in California and Alyssa had been talking about how she was potentially going to go live with her. So when they read that, they, you know, it made sense. The part that didn't really make sense though is the last part about the money. Alyssa had $1,800 in her bank account and that is absolutely more than enough to get to uh, California from Arizona. So it was just kind of odd that she had said, you know, I took $300 from you, that's why I saved my money. Considering all of it, Michael decided to call the police. He reported Alyssa as a runaway and he said, um, she left me a note, I, I'm pretty sure I know where she is. She said she was gonna go stay with her aunt. Uh, so, you know, we're pretty sure that that's where she is, but I just wanted to let you guys know, I want, I want a report made that I'm calling in that my daughter is missing. And so the police, you know, they're like, okay, cool, we'll, we'll make the report, but they didn't look into it because Michael said, I know where she's at, she's in California. So a week after this, supposedly, Alyssa called Michael from a payphone in California. Allegedly, she told him that she was indeed in California, she ran away because of him, and she was never coming back. After Michael got off the phone, he again called the police, basically just kind of gave them an update, said, okay, yeah, I heard from 
um, Alyssa, she's in California. She's where I thought she was. She's fine. So the police are like, okay, you know, they, they update the police report, but they don't do anything because Mike is telling them not to do not to do anything. He's saying she's gone, but I know where she is. But that's only what he's telling the police. What he's telling the rest of his family is that Alyssa's gone and I think something bad happened to her. I, I think, you know, someone was following her, someone wanted to hurt her, and, and something really bad happened. The police aren't doing anything, so I have to go search for her myself. And apparently he started putting up these missing persons flyers. He was going back and forth between Arizona and California uh, to search for the area where she was supposed to be. He was, you know, just, just doing all these things, telling everybody that he was so concerned about her, but at the same time telling the police, no, she's fine. Like not, not contacting them to say, oh, you know, I think, I think my theory has changed. I think something's wrong. Nope. Still doesn't contact the police about any suspicions he may have, but is constantly telling his family something's up. So obviously the police don't look for her. They have no reason to because allegedly he knows where she's at uh, and, and they don't do anything. But in 2006, a man named Thomas Heimer told police that he had information about what happened to Alyssa. Basically, this guy was convicted of murder and he was going through pictures of other like missing persons, potential victims, stuff like that to say, you know, oh, I know her. I know what happened to her. I did something to her, like picking out people that he had an association with and he picked out Alyssa's photograph. And here's what happened according to him. In the year 2000, he met Alyssa in a hotel room. They had violent but consensual sex. She did some heroin. Then he strangled her to death and violated her body. And when the police heard this, uh, they were definitely concerned about some of the things that he said that she had requested he do during their intimacy. And they were especially doubtful about the heroin uh, because heroin's not a, an easy addiction to hide. So they ended up going to her boyfriend and saying, hey, like, this guy said that she wanted this done in bed. I don't have the details. I wasn't able to find them. And even if I could, I don't think I would say them because it's unnecessary. But basically they asked her boyfriend, is this true? You know, do you know anything about this? And he's like, no, she, she didn't like anything like that. That doesn't sound like her at all. They asked him about the heroin. He said, absolutely not. They asked her friends about the heroin. They said, absolutely not. She would never do heroin. She, she was, she just wasn't doing heroin. She was not interested in heroin. It wasn't even a thought in her mind to try heroin. So shocker, dude's lying about everything. And even though they figured out that Thomas's story wasn't true, they decided to look a little bit further into what had happened to Alyssa because when they were investigating his story, they realized that Alyssa had not called anyone in her family since she disappeared, since she ran away. She'd not called anyone in her family. She's not contacted any of her friends. She did not call her boyfriend at the time who, why would she not? She literally told him the day that she went, ran away, I'm, you know, I'm going to lunch with my dad, but I'll see you tonight. I'll see you at the party. She literally told him that the day that she went missing. And you're going to tell me that she ran away and just never called him again? No. On top of that, the $1,800 that she had in her bank account had not been touched. Not a single penny of it. And her social security card had never been used. Meaning that she never enrolled in high school for her senior year. She never went to college. She never got a job. Nothing. All of these things point to the fact that she is not a runaway. Something happened. So they decide we've got to actually look into this case now. Like we've got to figure out what happened to this girl because obviously it was probably something that wasn't very good. So they start talking to Michael again, asking about Alyssa's behavior before she went missing. Uh, just, just kind of getting a, a better feel for who she was, the type of person she was, all that. And in the course of questioning Michael, 
they come into the knowledge that Michael has security cameras all over the house. So their first question obviously is, can we see the security footage from the day that she went missing? And conveniently, Michael says, oh, no, you don't need to see it. I watched all the footage and there's nothing interesting on there. Okay. Uh, they also realize that Michael has a little recorder attached to the home phone. Every call that comes in, every call that goes out, it is recorded. So they say, the day that you claimed she called you from California, can we have the footage? Can we, ha can we have the audio recording of that? And he says, ah, no, that was the one day that it just wasn't recording. It got turned off somehow. The police are definitely very suspicious at this point. So they get a, a warrant to search Michael Turney's house. And on December 8th, it's not funny. On December 8th, 2008, they search the Turney household and find 26 homemade pipe bombs, as well as a 97 page manifesto written by Michael titled Diary of a Madman Martyr. Okay, you're gonna wanna sit down for this because in this manifesto, Michael tells the story of what happened to Alyssa. Alyssa ran away in 2001. You know, that, that part's true. She was sick of it, she wanted to go live with her aunt and she ran. But here's the thing. She was followed by two men that used to work with Michael Turney. They were in the electrician's union with him. And why would they follow her, you ask? Well, Michael was a whistleblower. And so he believes that he, you know, he, he was a whistleblower. He, he told a secret and he exposed something within the union. So those two men, they were so mad. They had to get revenge. They, you know, they were pissed. And so they were like, we're gonna follow Alyssa and we are gonna murder her. So that's what they did. Those two men from the electrical union, they followed her, followed her right up to the point where they captured her and murdered her. But do not worry because Michael avenged her death by killing the two of them right back. And I know that that was a lot to take in. So let me just go ahead, give you a minute to process. And while you're doing that, I will try and ease your burden a little bit and let you know that Michael's description of events was 0% true. The police read this. They were incredibly skeptical and they decided to look up the two men that Michael had claimed uh, followed and murdered Alyssa and found out that they had absolutely died from natural causes. So these dudes didn't do anything to Alyssa they have no idea why Michael would write such a fantastical explanation of events, why he straight up says in his manifesto that Alyssa is dead. But despite all of this, you know, they're still going to be looking into Alyssa, but they've got to kind of uh, deal with, with the, pot, the pipe bomb situation first. So they keep looking into everything. They're looking at these documents. They find uh, tons of paperwork that Michael has kept including hundreds of hours of audio recording and video recording, uh, particularly of Alyssa that also included kind of more intimate moments between Alyssa and her boyfriend. They found letters where Alyssa was reaching out to other people claiming to have been molested by Michael. And they even found, I don't know why he had that. Like I literally don't know why he had those letters, but they also found the contract that Michael had made her sign. So they get all this and they approach Alyssa's boyfriend from before she went missing and her friends and they ask them, you know, did, did she tell you any of this stuff? Is this the first time you've heard anything? And they all tell the police like, yeah, Alyssa told us part of her story. They, she shared what she was going through in some capacity with us and everything lined up with what was said in the letters. So at this point, the police come to the conclusion that Michael had to have had something to do with Alyssa's disappearance. You know, all of this, all of this evidence, it's, it's just too much to be a coincidence. He had to have had something to do with it. And so they tell 
Alyssa's sister, Sarah, because the two detectives who ended up investigating this case, they were, like, incredible. They were empathetic, they were caring, they were dedicated, they formed a really great relationship with Alyssa's younger sister, Sarah, and so they tell her, hey, you know, we're searching your house, this is what we found, and we're pretty sure your dad had something to do with whatever happened to Alyssa. When she first heard it, she was like, no, no, that can't be right. But eventually she started, you know, sitting back, thinking about it, and um, just just really reflecting on her childhood and, and the way that she had been treated and the way that her sister had been treated and how different it was and and all that. And so eventually she did come to the realization that they wouldn't just tell her this if they didn't believe it themselves. So she comes around to what they've told her and uh, they also share with her that well, you know, yes, Michael is going to prison for now because he ended up taking a plea deal on the pipe bombs and was sentenced to 10 years in prison. They said, you know, once that's over, we are going to prosecute him. We think he did something to Alyssa and we're going to take him to court for it. So Sarah was like, okay, you know, I, I've, I've come to accept this. I, I know who my dad is now. I trust you. Let's wait. But Michael was released from prison in August of 2017. And the detectives who were initially assigned to Alyssa's case have been removed. For some reason, they, you know, they got rotated off and the new detectives who are supposed to be investigating this just really don't seem to have an interest in solving it or in fulfilling their commitment to uh, take Michael Turney to trial for this. And additionally, the records surrounding Alyssa's case have been completely mishandled by the Phoenix Police Department and Maricopa County Attorney's Office. Uh, Sarah's basically getting all these different stories. There's, you know, oh, well, because these files were so old, we ended up cycling through, we got rid of them. Uh, Sarah will request a case file and she won't get it and she won't get it and she won't get it. And so she'll approach, you know, a supervisor or someone higher up than those detectives and they'll say, oh, well, you never asked for it. You know, it's just, it's a systematic mishandling of information. And it's, it shows that these two departments have no real interest in getting justice for Alyssa. Like I said, Michael was released in 2017 and he, since then he's been a free man. He has not been prosecuted. He has not been uh, taken to trial. There's no preparation for trial. He's not been arrested, nothing. But despite all of this, Sarah remains undeterred. She is completely dedicated to getting Alyssa's story out there, getting her theory out there, the theory that was given to her by Phoenix PD that her dad had something to do with Alyssa's disappearance. And so she's talking about it. She's going on different podcasts. She has a petition to, um, the petition is to bring Michael Turney to trial. I signed it myself and she has her own podcast. Her podcast, Voices for Justice. Here's what I wanted to tell you. <laughs> Here's why I had such a hard time deciding how I was going to approach this case. Because I think the best person to tell Alyssa's story is Sarah. We don't know where Alyssa is. We don't know if she'll get a chance to tell us what happened to her. But Sarah is the closest person to the case that knows what happened, that can tell us the facts. And so... That was the overview. Go listen to Sarah's podcast. It's called Voices for Justice. She goes through police records. She has like hours and hours of audio from different phone calls, from conversations with her dad, stuff like that. And she's going through what we know of what happened to Alyssa and digging a little bit deeper, trying to actually find the truth, trying to get as much media attention on this as absolutely possible so that way it is impossible for Phoenix PD to ignore this because it's just, I'm not going to get worked up, but it is infuriating. It has to be. 
I can't even imagine what it's like to be her sister and know that the police said, we think he did this. He's going to jail for 10 years for these pipe bombs. But when he's out, we will prosecute him. And then to just for wait to wait 10 years for that. And then when he's released, suddenly it doesn't matter. So go check out Sarah's podcast. There is a link in the description box. And if you, you know, if from what I've told you about this story, you have suspicions about Michael Turney, um, I would definitely encourage you to sign the petition. It's going to be the first link in the description box under my sources. And um, if you're interested in learning more, if you don't want to take my word for it, you want to hear what Sarah has to say, or you want to look at different articles, of course, all of my sources are in the description box, including the link to Sarah's podcast. Go ahead, check them out, read them, see what conclusion you come to. And if you decide that you know, because of course, everyone is innocent until proven guilty. This is just a theory. This is presenting information that I have found through listening to Sarah, as well as through reading the actual news. Um, so if you come to your own conclusion, and you think that Michael should be brought to justice um, through the proper legal channels and through a court of law, definitely go ahead and uh, sign that petition because with every single signature, that's just another person who is supporting Sarah and telling her that we care about her sister and we care about justice. And we're not going to, we're not just going to let it get forgotten. Sign the petition, share the podcast, do whatever you can, get as much traffic to Sarah's podcast and, and Sarah's social media as you possibly can, because she's the one who's really should be telling this story. But I love that so many of you requested I tell it. Like I said, it was hard to figure out the approach, but I am, I'm glad that I'm just another person getting her story out there. And I really hope that it does make an impact and that it can just be part of a change that I'd like to see in the world. But that is all that I have to tell you about the case. Uh, if you've heard of this case before, leave me a comment letting me know what you think the most interesting or incriminating fact about this case is. And if you haven't heard of it before, let me know what you think. Obviously, I have a little bit of a bias, but if if you heard this case and you heard something different from what my opinion is, leave a comment down below. Let me know. I would love to hear it. And while you're doing that, if you would consider liking this video or subscribing to my channel, that would be incredible. And if you have subscribed already, thank you so much. I love being able to just sit here, hang out with you, and talk about whatever. And with all that being said, I'm going to go ahead and let you go. Thank you so much for watching. Please be kind to people, and I will see you in the next one. Bye.